Okay, before I start, I'm actually going to start with an apology. Uh, the guy from Moscow who is coming on next, he stole my slot. <laughs> so I've got, I prepared a very long presentation, which I now have to squeeze into uh, 15 minutes. So um, you'll, I hope you'll forgive me for rushing through this thing. Uh, you've probably already read about um, Operation Vula there, so I won't go into it. And I'm really going to skip over a lot of these slides here. I was active in the 1970s <clears throat> as an underground activist in South Africa. And these were the kind of communication methods that we used at that time. I have some pictures here of, these are just pictures of books that we used for book codes. And a book code worked something like this. So there you can see a little message, meet Johannesburg, eight o'clock. And you would find those words somewhere in the document and write down the position of them, as you can see here. And when you can't find the word, you make up a word out of the characters, like we've done there. Uh, this is a, a secret microfilm. You can see how it was hidden under a stamp. So this was in the 1970s, that little black thing is in a cutout under the stamp, and we used to send messages like that, and on that message would be a coded, a coded message, and there's the little microscope we used to, to be able to read them. This is just a demonstration of a card, we were using secret inks, so underneath that picture would have been a, a secret message with um, using secret inks. So here you can see the weakness of these methods. We were using hand coding, which was very slow and tedious, <clears throat> and it actually put you off communicating altogether. And um, I was active for two and a half years in the underground and eventually got arrested. Now, the reason for my arrest was probably many, and it was down to careful forensic work on the part of the police. But I put it down to weak communications because, in fact, towards the end of our operation, we knew that we were being followed by the police. But because our communications were so poor, we could do nothing about the situation. We couldn't call for help. We were still using the postal system, and there was nothing we could do. So I ended up in prison with a 12-year sentence. I was sent up to Pretoria prison, but fortunately, this is another story. I managed to escape from that prison with two others. <laughs> yeah. If you go to, um, to YouTube, you can look up my name and you'll find a, a film about it. So I arrived in uh, London in the early 1980s and they said, um, look, you have a lot of experience in the underground now and there's a constant stream of young South Africans coming out of South Africa. We're putting you in charge of the communications and their training in security. So I kind of revised the whole system, but remember this is still the early 1980s, there were no computers or anything like that. And I replaced all those uh, tedious book codes with what we call the one-time pad, I'll show you what that is next and introduced all kinds of other methods that you can read about there. So one-time pad encryption, any book, if you look up any book on encryption, they will tell you there's only one encryption system in the world that is absolutely secure and cannot be broken, provided it is used correctly. And that is called the one-time system. And it's a very simple, encryption system where your key is as long as your message. So if your message is 4,000 characters along, your, long, your key is 4,000 characters, and you only use it once, and you must destroy the key immediately afterwards. With, and that's what makes it absolutely secure. And it cannot be cracked with brute force um, methods, as they do with current uh, encryption methods, because it can reveal any plain text, and every possible plain text can be true, so you never know which one is the correct one. 
Okay, there's just an example of a one-time pad. It's called a pad because it came in a pad and you tore off the top strip. Uh, this is how it looked, just random numbers. And this is how you would encipher it. I'm sorry, I'm going through this very quickly. You would just have your message at the top, then each letter gets given a quantity, then you put the random numbers below that, you add them together using no carry method, and then you've got your cipher text at the bottom, which you send off. And the decryption or the deciphering is just the inverse of that. So this was one of the ways we used to hide the messages, that you simply write it on the back of a cassette tape and then you post that to someone else. You usually would do it on a new tape so it would look like casual music. And then it, even instead of the uh, black ink, we would use um, ultraviolet pens so you couldn't even see the writing on the back. Uh, there's an example of <coughs> ultraviolet pens and lamps for using for writing secret messages. And as the technology evolved, we used a thing called a tone decoder because the earlier phones were what are known as uh, pulse dial, where you had that dial thing, and they didn't make any tones when you, when you did that. And then the uh, touch tone telephone came into vogue, and with a tone decoder, you could simply phone someone at a distance and punch in the numbers of the code there on the right. So that would be your coded message. And you could just simply type in the numbers and the person on the other side could see the numbers coming up. So it was very simple. The next stage was to actually record those tones onto a, onto a tape recorder and then take that tape recorder to a public telephone dial up a long distance phone number, usually in London, and with that little microphone thing at the bottom, you could simply play that message safely into the telephone all the way to an answering machine in London, where the reverse process would be applied. There's just a picture of someone using it, sending the tones. This is what we gave to our activists. It was a just an ordinary electronic calculator disguised as a, uh, a tone pad was built into it, so you could type those numbers and record the tones, and then if you played the tones back into this device, the numbers would come up. And so this is what our activists used at home. This is the same thing, but it was disguised as a battery. That whole thing fitted inside that 9-volt battery, and you could take it out and use it for decoding the tones. So I'm going to, yeah, so in the, about 1985, the ANC had this big conference and they realized that the armed struggle was not going anywhere for the reasons that are there. And um, they took some, made some proposals about the future. And the main thing that was recognized was that this revolution was being ru run by remote control. So in other words, you had the generals sitting in Zambia trying to, trying to run the army of <laughs> soldiers in South Africa by remote control without any communications whatsoever. And that's why it got nowhere. So the idea was that you needed to get people back into the country. So Operation Vula was a result of this big conference and the decisions were taken to, to get leadership figures back into the country. Uh, the bottom line there, it was realized early on that for Vula to be successful, the number one requirement was for good communications. Now, I just happened to be down in Lusaka at this time when these decisions were made. And um, they called me to the head office there and they said, um, look, uh, we hear that you guys have been experimenting with computerized communications and that you've, you're into encryption and all these things. And this is what we want. We're planning to send people into the country. So we want computerized encryption. We don't want to do it by hand anymore because we know that's too slow. It doesn't work and people devoid it completely. We want an unbreakable cipher. Not an easy thing to do. We want safe communications for activists, which means that they can't use a normal telephone. They can't 
they need to, to communicate with the headquarters in Zambia, but they can't simply just phone up Zambia and send messages because that's far too dangerous. Uh, activists must be able to receive responses to their requests within hours. And there needs to be a way to send more detailed reports, etc. what you read there. So this was our challenge. And we didn't know much about encryption at all. We didn't know anything about communication. There was no internet. How are we going to do this? And above all, at the bottom it says, no special skills or under understanding required. So here you are, you have to teach people who've never used or even seen a computer before. You have to design an entire system like this, encryption, unbreakable ciphers, and communicate from South Africa to Zambia, however we did that. So that was quite a challenge. And our first thing was to take the old system of the tones and create this high-speed, what we call DTMF is the, is the name for those tones, and to be able to play these tones incredibly quickly over the phone lines and into a decoding device the other side, which would be hooked up to a computer. Now, we tested this out, and it did work, but it was still extremely slow because you had to send two tones for every character. <clears throat> so the maximum speed was like five characters per second, which was still incredibly slow. The next thing, uh, through our investigations, we came across this beautiful little device, and it seemed to be the, the, uh, the answer to our problem. Uh, it had a little keypad like that, so you could type in your message. It had a coding system. Uh, this is a, a report from uh, the Crypto Museum, and you can see there in the middle, it said it played an important role in the fight for Nelson Mandela's release from prison. That's not actually true, because we didn't use this thing in the end. For a number of reasons, one of them was because what it says at the bottom, the NSA expressed its concern about the ability of the DES algorithm. So even at that time, 25 years before uh, Edward Snowden, we realized that uh, there's possibly a backdoor in this thing. And the, there you can see how it works. Uh, you type your message, you take it to an, a telephone, a public telephone, and you simply play the message out the bottom of it. But the main drawback with this system was that you required two of these, one on each end. And we couldn't do that. We didn't want a system where you have one at one end and one at the other end. So we didn't actually use this thing. So you can see it's a beautiful little device. And this was our challenge. We needed to send from South Africa to Lusaka, which is only two countries away. But we couldn't do that. The lines were too bad. And apart from that, it was way too dangerous. You couldn't be phoning up and uh, conducting communications between South Africa and Lusaka. So it had to be done through London. <clears throat> and eventually, this is, the, this is the setup that we came up with. And this is what the activists had at home. This uh, early kind of Toshiba laptop and uh, program disk, data disks. So the data disks held the um, codes, the coding. An acoustic modem, which was plugged into the back of the computer, and uh, the tape recorder was plugged into the, uh, into the modem. So you would uh, type your message, encrypt it, send it through the uh, acoustic modem into the tape recorder, take the tape recorder to a public telephone with a little speaker at the bottom there, and you simply play it to an answering machine all the way in London. And then in London, we had this set up, an incoming and outgoing uh, answering machines that would receive the messages, and they would go back into the computer where they'd be deciphered. So what we call GCHQ is the name that we gave for our London office. It was a bit of a take on. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a list of the, the equipment that we had two of these stations in case the one went down or it got tacked or something, then we'd have a standby station. And this is some of the other equipment. We started using um, mobile phones, which started to become available. And then, uh, as the system increased, we needed more phone lines. They so couldn't have more phone lines installed in the one place. So we had lines installed at activist houses all around London and connected up with radio telephones. So we had many, many of these things. This is the program that we developed, a real old DOS program from that time. 
but you can see it's very simple to use. Built in a huge amount of security, so the program itself was encrypted when it was compiled, so you needed a password to enter it. Uh, the program was on a floppy disk, so if someone stole a computer, you didn't uh, lose it. Everything worked on a RAM disk, which means everything was like in the memory of the computer, so these files never existed. Uh, encryption, decryption in the RAM. <coughs> Very easy to use. You would simply go to F6, type a new document, type it. Uh, the file would get saved into the memory, uh, your end cipher. Um, and then that's just to show you how simple the algorithm was because we were using this one-time system. Uh, the next question came how to create totally random number disks. I'm running out of time here, but uh, this is... Hmm? So what did you do with it? You should you tell us what you managed to do. Okay, so these were some of the messages. This is me at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly skip over this. Yeah, it's a pity we can't. I wanted to go into all the security. This is just pictures of the uh, place where we operated from. There's all the equipment in our center in London. Uh, there's me again sending all this stuff. This is our workshop where we built all this equipment. Um, then we had a connection to Amsterdam and the Dutch anti-apartheid uh, helped us greatly. We had a, an air hostess who was continually flying into the country, taking in these computers and all this equipment, and especially our coding disks. So there's Connie Bram in, um, in the Netherlands. This is the other guys that we're assisting. Uh, this is our Lusaka office. Again, this is one of the uh, Dutch anti-apartheid activists who are running the, uh, the other far end of it. This is our air hostess. This is the kind of disguises. Uh, this is later equipment that we were developing. And finally, this is what Vula looked like. It uh, spread all over the world. We had all these connections. We kind of built our own internet prior to the existence of the internet using these sound files, sending them backwards and forwards. And so the achievements of Vula was that it enabled top leaders to get back into South Africa. It provided almost real-time connection for the first time in the whole history of the struggle. You now had activists inside the country who could communicate between themselves and with the leadership. And within two years, we'd achieved more than the previous 20 years. No one ever got arrested. The smuggling success rate, that means getting people, equipment, weapons, all kinds of stuff into the country, increased by thousands of percent. Nothing ever went wrong. We were connecting all the major centers, money was flowing, and all because of secure communications. And then our absolute coup was the last line. Nelson Mandela was actually brought into the system. He was still in prison. Uh, he was allowed visits from his lawyer who smuggled messages to him, and he smuggled messages out, and they went directly onto our system to the leadership in Lusaka. And at that very time, um, the South African regime was talking to Mandela in prison, uh, negotiating the terms of his release, and they were trying to create a split between him and the ANC, and they couldn't do it because he always was saying exactly what the ANC was saying. And that's simply because he was talking to the ANC the whole time. Thank you. Okay. Well, if you want some additional information. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I went over time there a bit. So you know, this is Matthias Spielkamp. Matthias uh, is a journalist yeah. and part of the board of uh, Reporters Without Borders in Germany. Thank you very much. Um, I promise to only take ten minutes because this uh, story was just too great to cut it short. I mean, Tim already cut it short a lot, um, and. Of course, out of respect for Juice Rap News yesterday, I'm going to wrap my presentation, right? <laughs> Just kidding. 
you know, you don't want to hear me rap, right? Okay, so I was asked to say a little about Reporters Without Borders, uh, who we are, what we do. It's an advocacy organization. The international um, organization was created about 26 years ago in France, in Paris. Um, and the idea was to um, make people aware of uh, freedom of expression and how it is threatened all over the world. And then five years later, the German section was created here in Berlin uh, by colleagues of mine. Some of them are still with the organization. Um, and the German section that is important in, um, in this context here is the only one that is independent from the French organization in the sense that, of course, we are um, a, the same organization, but we have our own funding and uh, we have our own um, network of members and we have our own donations. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we also uh, try to act here as an organization that uh, tries to defend press freedom in Germany. And the way we do that is by picking another one of these difficult targets, which is the uh, German Foreign Intelligence Agency, the BND. Um, because we are saying that um, what they're doing, the surveillance that they are doing, is overbroad and uh, not in line with the law in Germany. Uh, so we decided to sue them. Now, a couple of words about that, because that is something that is not uh, done on a regular basis in Germany. Uh, many of you who come from the United States or from Britain, you are familiar with this idea of uh, strategic litigation, that you open some lawsuits, that you file, uh, that you file lawsuits, that you uh, sue companies or the government uh, for strategic reasons, meaning that you identify um, a target, a goal, um, for example, you know, to, uh, um, it could be the NSA or the GCHQ establishing that they are also not in line with the law, um, and then uh, you sue them. Now, this is difficult in Germany because of the legal system. There are no class action lawsuits in Germany except for a couple of very um, limited exceptions in environmental law and in uh, consumer law. Um, but uh, the problem is that you always have to establish standing, which means that you have to be directly affected. You know, if you want to file a lawsuit, you have to make clear that you are directly affected, affected by uh, the law that uh, you are trying to challenge or the regulation that you are trying to challenge. And, and that is uh, difficult sometimes. Um, it's not difficult, though, in this case. Because the situation in Germany is that um, the... German Foreign Intelligence Agency, BND, has been surveilling um, telecommunications in Germany for a long time. Um, some of you might be aware that we have a parliamentary um, commission that is looking into the NSA. You know, it's called the NSA Parliamentary uh, Commission, but it has turned out uh, in the 13, 14 months that it's already been going on uh, to be a BND Parliamentary Commission. Because what we did find out was that the BND is uh, not, a lot of, uh, not, not a lot better than the NSA. It doesn't have the means that the NSA has or the GCHQ uh, technologically and uh, in terms of money, but um, they are certainly not abiding uh, by the German laws. So we are in a very similar situation than people in the United States, in uh, Great Britain, uh, in France and other countries where we have these spy agencies that uh, are pretty much uh, getting out of hand. Um, we had some spectacular uh, situations in that uh, inquiry commission where people would just say things that, you know, basically blew everyone's mind and they were saying them um, as if they were the most normal thing that, that uh, they could be talking about, revealing uh, some information about this. So what did we, uh, about the um, surveillance uh, practices that they are employing? So what did we do? We... Um, found a lawyer who is very knowledgeable in these things, which is um, very um, rare in uh, Germany and in most other countries, because there are not a lot of lawsuits that target the surveillance agencies, right? I mean, you don't, on a regular basis, sue your uh, foreign intelligence agency. So it's very hard to find someone who knows a lot about that. And in his case, it was because he, as an attorney, had already filed a lawsuit against the BND before that, uh, but it was struck down. So uh, he was very eager to file another one, and this time he teamed up with us, with uh, Reporters Without Borders in, in Germany. Um, and the 
uh, reasons why we are saying that the BND is not in line with uh, German law are twofold. First of all, we think that the surveillance that they are employing is overbroad. Um, it's indiscriminate, and they are just surveilling um, millions and millions of email messages and uh, social media messages, phone messages, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we are arguing that um, this is um, a breach of the German law because, first of all, um, you can't do it generally. Secondly, as a journalistic organization, we also uh, enjoy some privileges. For example, there are very strict shield laws in Germany, meaning that journalists can protect their sources. We don't have to reveal our sources um, doing our research, uh, even when we have to go to the courts. Um, so this is one part of it, and that targets the, let's say, general surveillance practices that the BND employs. Now, the difficulty with that is that um, it is very similar to the first lawsuit, this first part of it is very similar to the first lawsuit that this attorney brought against the BND, and it's not unlikely that it will be struck down again. Um, I'm not going to go into the very... Um, tiny details of this, uh, of this legalese here, uh, but the thing is that uh, basically the um, court in the first lawsuit argued that the lawyer failed to make clear that he was directly affected. Now, that's pretty much of a joke, as you can imagine, because the BND works in private, you know, it's a clandestine organization, it's not going to tell you that uh, they surveilled you. Now, the court, nevertheless, asked for clear proof of uh, this lawyer um, having been affected by the surveillance. So it's pretty much of a catch-22. Um, we think this law, if it was interpreted correctly by the uh, court in that lawsuit, um, will have to be struck down by the Constitutional Court. So this time, when we are going to court the, against the BND, and uh, we are, as I said, somewhat expecting, we have hope, uh, because we, of course, changed the lawsuit according to the newest information or latest information that we have, but if we do lose um, in, on, on that count, we are going to go to the Constitutional Court in Germany that has a, a very good reputation of um, being... Um, of, of um, protecting uh, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, um, privacy, and so on and so forth. So we have some hope there. Um, but what is also very interesting is the second part of our lawsuit that was not part of what the, um, this other guy did in the first, uh, the first time around, because in the meantime, it became apparent that the BND is using a database that is called VERAS, for the Germans among you, Verkehrsinformationssystem, and that is collecting metadata, about 500 million data sets a month, um, and it's not really disputed that they're using that. They're just saying that, yeah, well, you know, we are a surveillance agency, we can use that kind of database. But there was no data retention law in Germany at the time, so basically there are no legal grounds for um, using this kind of database, storing, I mean, first of all, collecting this data, then storing it, then analyzing it, and then drawing conclusions from it. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, um, of course, we by now have received some uh, responses from the lawyers of the other side, from the BND. They are uh, very quiet about this case, or this, this uh, part of the case. So I'm, I'm really uh, interested to see what will happen um, in the court, and as I said, if we uh, will lose in this, um, at this appellate court, the German uh, federal, um, it's, a, it's a federal administration court, uh, we will go to the constitutional court. And let me say one more thing before I end. Um, we are doing a lot of freedom of information work here in Germany, and of course we are um, our basis is our members, our membership and uh, donations. And we would like to um, open um, a position for that again, which we had in the past, but we had to let this uh, great person go um, because we didn't have the funding. So if you'd like to join our organization or contribute to this fight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Stefania Maurizzi, yes. who is a journalist and works with L'Espresso in Italy. Um, you worked for seven years with the uh, WikiLeaks uh, cables, and you worked with Green Glenwald on uh, the Snowden documents. And you're going to tell us about the difficult targets you face. Absolutely. <laughs> 
So thank you <clears throat> for inviting me to come to speak on this panel. And uh, I'm not sure whether I can tell you stories about courage. I, I think my sources, WikiLeaks, Julian Assange and his entire staff, Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, deserve the credit for uh, <clears throat> revealing extremely important documents never seen before. And they are confined in exile, uh, in prison, for, just for doing what we journalists and our sources are supposed to do every day. What I can definitely share with you <clears throat> are stories, uh, are stories of professional tenacity, because to do investigative journalism, you need to be tremendously stubborn. You, I would say you need to be obsessive. Difficult targets uh, always expect journalists to give up because this is how the media work. The media always focus on the next big stories. So I remember, for example, <coughs> trying to get access to the infamous A.Q. Khan, the father of the first atomic, Pakistani atomic bomb. And I spent four years trying to get access to him. And finally, when I was able to access him, and I told him what the CIA boss, George Tenet, had declared. We were inside this facility, inside, inside these rooms. We were inside these labs. He told me, well, why did they then stop me? So, I mean, it was definitely worthwhile. Uh, partnering with WikiLeaks, I was, I was spent the last seven years partnering with them, we were able to hit very difficult targets, like the U.S. military industrial complex, <laughs> tremendously difficult, and the wars in Afghanistan, in Iraq, the WikiLeaks cables, I spent one year on the WikiLeaks cables. But I, can, I could tell you good paranoia stories about the... the, the the obsession of getting fake documents, uh, fake documents which can basically destroy your professional credibility and the professional credibility of your source, WikiLeaks. But I could tell you also good stories of tough journalistic work on these documents to verify documents, to understand whether they are genuine documents, whether they are authentic. So I would like, for example, to <clears throat> discuss the last latest WikiLeaks revelation on NSA spying on Berlusconi. Two weeks ago, we revealed NSA spying on Italian leadership. Of course, the Italian leadership was mad because they are so corrupt that they realize that <laughs> the NSA can keep blackmailing them for centuries. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they're using this interception. <laughs> so they, they were very paranoid. And what happened? For the first time, the Italian prosecutors opened an investigation on NSA spying on the Italian leadership. So I would be very, it is very likely that I will be interrogated as a witness against the NSA, probably. <laughs> so our lawyer advised me against speaking publicly about uh, our work on, on the NSA files until we know precisely what this investigation uh, is about, because uh, our lawyer told me, well, you are lucky if they don't investigate you before revealing these files. You are lucky if they just uh, call you and interrogate you as a witness against the S NSA. So I will not go on that very difficult target. I want to tell you about this <clears throat> revelation. This revelation goes back to 2012, Syria files, millions of internal emails of uh, the Syrian regime. While reading these thousands of these emails, we stumble on Im an important story. Basically, we stumble on, <coughs> on a major, an important Pentagon contractor, Finmeccanica, which is the, defense the Italian defense giant. And basically, this company had sold very sensitive equipment technology, very sensitive te communication technology to the Syrian regime in the middle of one of the worst crackdowns on, on the Syrian uh, population. So by reading these thousands of emails, thousands, because each email contained tiny bits of information, so you had to connect the dots. But most of all, you have to 
verify the documents. Because when you have, when you deal with big companies, big corporations on the stock market, you cannot afford to get things wrong. Their lawyers can file devastating libel case against you. Millions, hundreds of millions of damages, civil damages against you because they are in the stock market. So we had this concern and we had also another concern. Five years before, uh, five months before the Syria file, we had revealed with WikiLeaks the Stratford file. And a few weeks before this revelation, we discovered that the F FBI had basically entrapped the alleged WikiLeaks source, Jeremy Hadmon, using an informant, the infamous Sabu. So we were obsessed about the possibility of getting uh, false docu documents. Uh, we were obsessed about the possibility of the FBI planting false documents. So we check everything. And likely, <laughs> the company had, ma had made a very important mistake. So it was very useful for us. I, I will not tell you what kind of mistakes. We, what kind of mistakes, because <laughs> I don't want to reveal it. So it was very useful. So in the follow-up to our revelation, and even in the libel cases filed against me, our work on the WikiLeaks files, on the Syria files, but other, also on other files, was vindicated. When you have to go to the court, you have to prove that you are telling the truth. You have to prove that the documents are genuine. You cannot afford to say, well, <laughs> let's see. And most of all, the documents are on the public domain. WikiLeaks publishes everything. The documents are online. So if the journalists uh, spin the story, if the journalists invent anything, I mean, they can be spot immediately. <laughs> the documents are out there and you can verify them. So it's very easy. So I'm very positive about the, my experience in working about on difficult targets with WikiLeaks. And I'm confident about their ability to protect high value sources. I have witnessed in the last seven years how they care about sources. I'm less positive about my capability, my <clears throat> possibility to protect my own high value sources in the age of mass surveillance. Why I'm less confident. If you, if you consider the data retention laws, data retention laws basically are the most instrumental tools in allowing the prosecutors to acquire journalists' metadata. These laws are still in place in Italy, no matter the, the European Court uh, <coughs> sentence on the European Data Retention uh, Directive. These are still in place, you know? And Metadata, if you never <laughs> thought about this, metadata is our enemies because journalism is developed through human interaction. Human interaction requires contact, communication. Every time our sources contact us, or every time we contact our sources, uh, the email uh, account, the telephone leave a trace, and that trace nailed to us, to our sources forever. How can journalists solve the metadata problem? I mean, there is no magic wand, and this is very important. It's very important to understand that this is a very complex problem, and there is no magic wand to solve it. As things stand today, the Italian investigator can acquire my metadata and any journalist's metadata in the very same way they ac acquire drug smugglers uh, and all sorts of criminal metadata. There is no difference whatsoever. I mean, the, there is, and these kind of laws are totally incompatible, in my opinion, with source protection. There's no way you can do this kind of, of things to journalists. Otherwise, source protection doesn't exist. But let me tell you that I'm very little confident about uh, the fact that if we change this law, uh, if we change law, uh, we can solve the problem. I mean, when you have to do with difficult targets, like the NSA, like the intelligence services, like big corporations, they have all the tools to acquire our meta metadata in a purely legal way. So I'm, I'm not sure that any change in laws could help us. When it comes to metadata, the only winning move with metadata is not to create it. 
99% of my sources are totally unable to protect their communication. This is one of my obsessions. I started working with Wikileaks because in 2010, in 2007, one of my sources was crushed, not because of my <laughs> mistakes, likely, uh, but because she was targeted by illegal interception, physical surveillance, and she finally decided to give up. I never discovered what she had discovered about a very important politician. I was never able to talk to her because she refused any contact. She was a vulnerable person. At that time, one of my sources, a brilliant cryptographer and a, a very decent human being, told me, you should have a look on that bunch of lunatics. The lunatics were a Sanjay and his team. It was 2008, and basically no one knew about Wikileaks or Julian Assange. Uh, Wikileaks had been established just two years before. So it was that episode who made me very, obses made me very obsessive <laughs> about these kind of problems. Seven years later, my sources show no awareness about mass surveillance, about metadata, about uh, um, protection of their communication. And when I try to address these kind of things with sources, because I care <laughs> about them, I realize that basically they, they're concerned, but they are not really determined to, determined to go farther, to do something. Many of them suggest to meet in person, which is not the solution, you know? I experienced tailing in many occasions. And if you consider high power microphone, you think you are alone with your sources. You are not. So in, in many occasions, I discuss this problem with colleagues. And they tell me, oh, don't do this, because otherwise your sources will get scared and no one will talk to you anymore. But you know, I disagree with this approach because when it comes to serious consequences for the lives of our sources, I think we cannot afford to say, to play tricks, you know? We have not only a duty, a professional duty of protecting our source, it is also, it is first of all a matter of human decency to care about our sources. Thank you. Beautiful. Our next speaker is uh, Paul Wiebeck, the Pink Collective, from the installation downstairs. How did it work here? Uh, is this thingy starting automatically? I don't know. Ah, oh, there it is. So, uh, this is, you don't need to read it. This is just a um, something we discovered. Uh, in internal documents of a kind of secret service magazine where they already acknowledge that they have certain moral problems. But basically, we were spinning around our heads as um, activist campaigners, or actually I decided to say I'm not an activist, I'm not an artist, I'm not a journalist, because all these categories are like getting all wild here. But however, uh, we thought, how can we tackle the problem of uh, mass surveillance, of uh, drone strikings, like drone wars and all that, in a way that is not fear-mongering, and in a way that is not defensive in, in the attitude or the way to write about it, but it's kind of like going forward and giving tools and tactics to, to tackle that. So um, we started, no, I should put in your password, I think, Matthew. It says. Uh, <laughs> It says the uh, password. You need a thing. Huh? You need a thing. Do you think? Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Okay, it worked. So we came up with that. Is it, can you put the tone on? Um, I think we have to restart it now, because... You go back and forth again. No, it'll start the video where it just left. However, we just... They don't ask questions. They follow orders, keep their heads down, do their work. But what happens when you see something you can't forget? You realize that the system you are part of is chipping away at democracy. Every hour, every day, you feel stuck, overwhelmed. 
some people have already made the decision to leave. Others are thinking about it every day. Intel Exit helps people break free from the intelligence community and build a new life. You expose yourself within the system, you ultimately could end up being forced out of the system. I remember confronting my immediate supervisor, the number three person, about what are we doing? We're in violation of the Constitution. Many Secret Service uh, employees are disillusioned. Why are we taking equipment that is traditionally foreign-facing, foreign outward-facing, and we're now instrumenting our networks within the United States of America? If you are surveilling the population, you're all on the same side, right? You want all the data, and you want to talk to people who have the most data. So the NSA is a nexus of surveillance for the world. It's whatever you could get away with. That was part of the game. And it was ever whatever would serve in the interest of national security. When one is forced to act against one's moral values, he can experience extreme levels of what we call cognitive dissonance. Ich hatte damals keine Hilfe. Ich habe zehn Jahre gebraucht, um, um zu erkennen, wofür ich bei der Staatssicherheit verantwortlich gewesen bin. I was radioactive because I'm questioning what are we doing? Where do you then go? Where does your life then, where do you recreate your life? What Intellexa does is help individuals transition from the world on the inside to the world on the outside. Wissen Sie, dieser Intel Excel Verein ist wirklich eine gute Sache. The more you can move from the inside to the outside, the better you'll integrate into the real world. What is really great about Intel Excel is that it helps people to confront their fears. So take it from me, if you're looking to get out, try Intel Exit. Be smart. Exit intelligence now. Um, so, so thanks a lot, Thomas, for doing that. Bruce Schneier also uh, helped a lot. Yeah, hey, there he is. Give him a random applause, because he helped a lot. <laughs> and actually, I, I, think, I think it's thanks, Thomas, especially also to all those who are choosing to work with us, even though they're very exposed, and to do like tongue-in-cheek uh, projects might be a damage to their reputation and still choose to play along. And so that's like really helpful because it gives a lot to the narrative. As the two others um, were actors, so they are from a state theater and just played the Stasi guy and the psychologist. But... Um, so the idea was, and I'm, I'm just going to skip through that quickly, because uh, so we, you know, we got trucks and we were driving around the NSA and trying to get them out. We went to their like lunch breaks um, and, and really tried to, to like make them stop working because we have no other idea of what we can do with this whole complex thing. The laws are, you know, from the 70s and it, it, we will never be able to really fight this game if we just go for legal stuff. To create transparency, it's great, but it's like not changing the power structures, so still, you know. Uh, we were really like struggling, what can we do? And so that's what we did. We took like actually uh, another truck around the GCHQ and like a lot of other billboards all around uh, uh, yeah, different stations of the NSA in Germany and BND and all that. Um, and then we did this. We did this primarily. <laughs> Thank you. 
I have, I have little time, so let, let me go quickly. We did this primarily because this topic is still a niche topic. I mean, we all know about it, it's still very big in the media, but general public does not really care. So this is why we do stunts and we do like narratives that people can talk about over a beer, not really understand the, the complexity. And uh, so, I mean, I'm here on, on a stage of like um, Logan, and so I thought, what, where, you know, where's the investigative part of what we do? I mean, obviously we, we go very deeply into the topics, we talk to a lot of people, we read, understand what's going on, but not to write a book. Um, but what happens then is that after we do media spectacle, people show up and say things they wouldn't say otherwise. So then you get new information. For example, the GCHQ coming up and reacting to us and like saying they have nothing to do with us. Or saying that they're very proud of their ethical doubts programs that people can go there and, you know, um, tell them like from inside and tell them they have ethical doubts and they, they will be helped, which is absolutely absurd. But still, um, they said that like uh, after two weeks after Kama Police uh, reacting to our campaign, they said they were um, always working on very uh, moral and ethical groundings. So this is things you usually do not get reactions from GCHQ and such, but this is not a breaking story. Um, and we do not create breaking stories as such, except, except that many sources might come to us because they trust us more than journalists. So still then, people might come up after this, um, this uh, Intellexit launch, and we are, we are dealing with it, we have secure communications, we are uh, taking care of them as much as we can with our capacities, but basically we are helping them with our network. So we do not want to have um, whistleblowers coming up to us because that's not our business, and we just hand them on to journalists. So what we do as Pen Collective is creating what someone called once a cultural sculpture, which is then creating reactions from society on what you know, we kind of invented there. And it doesn't really matter if it's real or not because reality then does react and f fall into it. Um, but when, I, when I'm talking here, I, I thought I want to stress that we are... Uh, wait, was there actually another slide? Oh yeah, oh, yeah that's, the, that's the last thing we did now here in the, down there. There's this call a spy installation where you can actually go down and call spies. Yesterday was better because they had uh, working hours. I don't know if you can still reach people working on Saturdays, but you can try. So just go ahead. Um, and it's a dial through. So you, it's like it's, it's the launch was yesterday here. So we acquired a lot of uh, phone numbers from NSA and DH DHS, FBI, and you know all kinds of uh, agencies and they're just in the system. So you can try it out. Um, but what we do there again is to try to like break through this wall of, of narratives that they're like unreachable, uh, because I believe that's very important to, to like not dwell on, on fear of people uh, talking about this issue, even though there's a good reason. But so what I want to underline here is that um, even though I'm not an activist and not an artist and not a journalist, uh, let's construct the ideas of the judges we still have in place, which are saying they're activists and they're journalists. And um, because that is reality. And I, I believe we are allies and we are very, a very weird kind of allies because we have a few more conflicts. Um, one, uh, let's start with the, where are we allies? Like Pen Collective and a lot of other artists and activists are creating uh, narratives. They are creating momentums for journalists to write about. And who is getting paid for the article? It's the journalists. So we are living in an economy where people who are uh, more, more uh, vulnerable, in a way, create stories, uh, might be sued for it, and fight for ethical, moral um, beliefs that we actually share. This is freedom of expression. Um, in, in case of Intellexit, for example. And then what comes out of it is a story which is critical or not. Um, and, and, you know, the, the activists and journalists are actually working hand in hand here. As well, when I'm talking about the sources who come to us and we just hand them over, we try to, like, you know, I, I, I acknowledge the market situation of the journalists. So I, what I did in the beginning was, like, I called up four, four at once and I said, look, there's a source who wants to have it. And they were all like, is she getting it? Then I don't want to have it. Just give it to me. Then. And it was like, wait a moment. Oh, oh, I, I forgot. There's a market uh, situation on the journalist side. So there, again, 
I learned how to work with those kind of people who are having a boss and who, you know, have to sell their information and all these kind of things. But what I take out of this as well um, is that there is a very certain power relation between activists and journalists, which is that in the end, it's the journalist who's, who's writing the story. Uh, in the end, it is also the, the activist who might be sitting in court. But it's also, so, I mean, I think there is a certain... Uh, if I think about how often I emphasize with I have to understand how this person is thinking and that's the way I'm going to talk to him and that's my, what, I, what I'm going to expect uh, from this person uh, in terms of how to deal with my sources, uh, in, in terms of how to you know, uh, approach the story and so on and so forth. I mean, this whole like, detailed stuff you have to think about when you, when you approach the press as an artist or, or, an, or an activist. But what I also understand, and I think to understand that, uh, or what I want to, to emphasize here, is to create an awareness about exactly this fact, that um, this is what, let's say, we uh, have to do as activists, artists, working on these topics. But on the other hand, and this is something we know from, from other studies, that people in higher, hierarchically higher positions do way less emphasize uh, with people in lower positions. Uh, this is in, in you know, any kind of uh, enterprise or whatever. But, so I would always, and this is done here in Logan a lot, people are talking about protective sources, you know, it, look at them as human beings and so on and so forth. But it is, um, yeah, I, I think it's important to also to always try to understand, wait a second, this activist actually has this and this and this interest, and maybe I will just not break a story. I'm just like not gonna write this down because you know, it's not good for him. And it happened quite a few times that we gave information in a trustful way and then bounced to the other colleague and the third colleague and he didn't care anymore about the interests of the activist or the sources or whatever and then it, they broke a story because it's so nice to break a story again. And this is something that is like, uh, I think we should be very aware of. Um, I think that's kind of it. Yeah, I think that's it. And the last speaker of this session is uh, Matt Kennard. He's fellow with the Center for Investigative Journalism. He's fellow with the Bertha Foundation. You are a staff writer at the Financial Times in uh, New York, London and Washington. And you're author of The Irregular Army about how the US military uh, reverted neo-Nazis, gangs and uh, other criminals to fight in the war on terror. And uh, last year you were, did a record of a large investigation on working with corporate... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about um, a difficulty which probably everyone who's a journalist in the room has had before, which is taking on corporations and corporate power while working within the corporate media. Um, I've got some personal experience of it and the... the picture up there is a book I released last year which is about five or six years of uh, attempting to uh, investigate um, the uh, corporations often allied with the US government and sometimes the US military as they try to suck uh, wealth and resources from the poor world to the rich. So my story started really, most of the reporting in the book is uh, when I was at the Financial Times. Um, I left journalism school uh, quite idealistic about what I could do within the system itself. So I started at the Financial Times thinking I could write stories that put people before profit uh, and actually uh, focused on what corporations were doing uh, in a critical way. But I soon found out at the FT um, with a lot of rejection letters from editors that that wasn't possible. So what happened was I then, I left eventually and started working with uh, newspapers which you might assume would be more in, in tune with my politics and my outlook, like The Guardian. Uh, and The Guardian got a kick in yesterday, uh, and I'm going to give it a kick in again. Uh, but The Guardian, when I started writing for The Guardian, I sort of thought, well, they're not, they're not going to be like the FT, but in fact, they're a lot worse in terms of their, uh, the fact they're in bed with corporations. And uh, I'm going to discuss one particular case, because what happens with advertising is it's very insidious. It's very hard to pin down where the pressure points are, where the effect of advertising has on editorial content. But in this case, which I'm about to talk about, it's actually quite clear, in my opinion. So uh, last year, I went with my colleague, Claire Provost, who's also at the uh, CIJ. And we went to El Salvador uh, in Central America to work on a story. Actually, the, story, the main story we were doing was about the Investor State Dispute Settlement System, or ISDS, which is this system 
whereby companies can sue states uh, if, they don't, if they do things they don't like. So, for example, if uh, Egypt raises the minimum wage and the French water company doesn't like that, they can take them to court and say that that impacts my future profits, so I want some money. In fact, that was a real case that happened. So in El Salvador's case, they'd been sued by a, a Canadian mining company for $300 million. So we went there to look into this. Um, and then when we were there, we were talking to a lot of the activists in El Salvador, and they were saying, actually, the big issue in El Salvador is water stress. It's the most water-stressed country in the whole of Central America, and there's just water is at a massive premium there. You can't get it. Um, and they said, you should go to this place called Nahapa, which was a town uh, an hour outside the capital of San Salvador. And uh, what, what was happening there was there was there's one of the biggest aquifers in the country, but the local people on top of that aquifer could not afford to get the water because it was massively jacked up prices. Yet down the road, there were all these multinational corporations getting the water at very cheap rates and using it to bottle Coca-Cola and brew different drinks that we all drink. Um, and then, so they'd brew these drinks, send them out of the country, probably paying no tax. So really it was a real uh, a racket in terms of what the effect it was having on the local people. One of the women, the, her picture's up there, she compared what the corporations were doing to, on her doorstep to the conquistadors who came and conquered uh, the Americas in the 15th and 16th century. So that turned into a good story which we eventually did do for The Guardian. So you can see there, it says, water everywhere for profit in the happen, but few drops for local people to drink, which is a fair enough headline to be fair to The Guardian. It is to the point, they don't smudge it too much. But I just encircled some of the things that you now get with Guardian content. So you obviously get the advert from Ford Cars, which is pretty standard in newspapers, but also you see up there that the whole of the development website is sponsored by the Gates Foundation, uh, which is not cool because the Gates Foundation is not a neutral... Uh, foundation when it comes to development. It's actually one of the more uh, seen as more neoliberal pro corporate. So to have it as your main funding source for your whole development website is a big problem. Um, and subsequently, so a few days later, I was reading The Guardian again and I saw this article pop up, which is an interview with Sab Miller, which is one of the companies we'd looked into, an, an interview with their Latin America division president. This is a guy that no one's ever heard of not worthy of like a, even a few lines, but they published a news article which was a 900 word press release masquerading as a news story. And it was all about, Sab, it was giving Sab Miller basically the space, and it was actually longer than our original article, space to defend themselves against what we'd said and what the local people had said. Uh, and, blame, and then the, the president basically said, it's nothing to do with the companies, this is all based on politics and poor infrastructure, which is a, tr a really, traditional way of corporations getting out of uh, any sort of culpability on this fact. So I thought, this is very weird. It's, it's quite random. To, uh, I talked to The Guardian, and The Guardian said, well, actually, uh, we'd planned to run this before. But I thought, well, that's a bit of a coincidence that they're running this uh, news story with a non-entity that no one's ever heard of three days after uh, our article, and he replies at length. Anyway, subsequently, I looked into it a little bit, and I saw that The Guardian actually has a whole website which it shares with Sab Miller, called uh, Sustainable Business Partner Zone, which, where, it gives the guard, where it gives Sab Miller a uh, license to publish all sorts of articles about all the wonderful things they do in the world. And there was even an article I saw there, based, uh, which was written by one of their PR people about water security. Now, I can't prove that um, uh, uh, The Guardian published that piece, but, uh, that interview, because of this zone, but it does raised some questions, and what I imagine happened is after our article was published, and Sab Miller, by the way, has one of the most aggressive PR teams I've ever come across. They demanded that uh, we send them the article before it was published, and they demanded that we change their quote three times. Uh, we refused, but what I imagine, they were aggressive on the phone to The Guardian, they said, look, you've given this space to these reporters, we now want, our, we're gonna send our Latin, America, Latin American division head along, and we want you to interview them at length. And they should have said no, if they were independent, newspaper and not uh, in bed with corporations, they would have said no, but they didn't do that. And what happened in the end was that in this battle between some of the poorest people in the world that can't get water and, so, and one, a multi-billion dollar company, uh, the Guardian took the side of the multi-billion dollar company and basically the last word was given to them. Uh, that's just an example. And this is the progressive end of the spectrum. So you can start to see what problem we have in, in media when it's uh, in bed with corporations in this way. So I'm just going to go back a bit and talk about the my experience at the Financial Times, which was similar, but actually uh, the way that corporations uh, get what they want in the, in the FT is, is quite different to the, to the Guardian. So I'm gonna use as an example what happened when I went to Haiti. I was sent by the Financial Times to Haiti in 2011, which is 18 months after the earthquake. 
And I was told to cover the reconstruction, and I arrived. And obviously, if you work for the Financial Times, you get everyone wants to speak to you. You get taken around in a four by four by the World Bank. You get fl I was flown up to a special economic zone they were building it in the north of Haiti. So I got all access that I wanted. Anyone I wanted to speak to, I could get. But the re what I realized when I was there was the reason that they were doing that was because they, they assumed I was one of them. So they assumed that I was going to write an article that would be nice to them. And, they were, and, and to be fair, that assumption is a fair enough assumption. I bet 99% of the time when a, a, a financial journalist goes and they get all this nice treatment, they do get the press that they want. But I wasn't of that mind. And what I actually saw in Haiti was the imposition of what Naomi Klein called the shock doctrine, whereby the World Bank, the, the various regional development banks, uh, and the US government were basically using this massive humanitarian crisis to push through an economic program they've been trying to push through since the 90s uh, with not much success. Um, they, tried, they, they did a coup which took the president, uh, President Aristide, out a couple of times, but it didn't work. And there were still state-run institutions, etc. But as you can see, so I pitched this story to the FT, I pitched the shock doctrines type of story, and, and I was rejected, obviously. This isn't what our readers want. They're not, uh, re investors don't want to know about this sort of thing. So in the end, I published a story which you can see, which was a boring story, which I'm not particularly proud of, but it just sort of shows what you can, what you can write. And it's about investment in Haiti and how what's happening there is affecting investors. Um, but then eventually, obviously, I didn't get into journalism to be a corporate shill, so I left the FT eventually. Uh, and, but what, at, towards the end of being at the FT, I realized that, well, I'm never going to have this access again. I need to use it uh, to get as much testimony as I can from the power players in the world. And then when I, when I come out, I can use it uh, and contradict it with what I know to be true. So this is uh, what happened. So in, in, uh, when I left, not soon after, I published the real story of what I'd seen in Open Democracy. Uh, and they, as you can see, they titled it Haiti in the Shot Doctrine. And what I did was basically use all the, all the so the, world, the head of the World Bank uh, in Haiti, the UN, the, the US ambassador, I used everything they told me and contradicted it with a lot of the stuff that I found through WikiLeaks cables, various testimony I got from uh, the, the other side, the sort of unions and civil society, uh, and then published that. When that was published, uh, I instantly got uh, a lot of emails from the contacts that I'd been with in Haiti, and they just said to me, how can you say this? This is, this is ridiculous. This, they couldn't understand how someone who had previously worked for the Financial Times would have this critical point, point of view. And basically, they said, we'll never talk to you again. And that is how it works. Access-based journalism only works if you do what they want you to. So it's a very manipulative relationship. Uh, and in fact, if you want to do truly independent reporting, you can't really do it if you base it on access. Um, and then, sorry, I just put under that, I had a bit more confidence even in my book where I called it Creating a Modern Day Slave State. So I upped, upped the stakes in terms of how I framed it. Um, so these are some of the takeaways that I got from working in the corporate media. In, is, it's basically how it works is that the default position of a, of, of a journalist in the corporate media is you support corporate power and you basically support American imperialism. You can have little arguments about, um, this is in the UK and US by the way, but you can have little arguments about whether that war was wrong or that war was right, but basically we're always seen as the good guys. Now if you start to subvert that conception, you start being told you're an activist, you're a maverick, you're biased, you're not serious, all these different epithets that they use to shut, shut people down. Now, I don't give a shit really about that sort of stuff, but there are, when you're a young journalist coming into the world of journalism and all the people above you are basically, marg uh, you know if you say certain things, you're going to be marginalized, it's a very powerful way of stopping people saying things that are not conducive to the system running as, it, as they want it to. Uh, and there's a good bit of wisdom there, and like all good bits of wisdom, it's from Twitter, but it says, uh, if you're sympathetic to the weak, it's activist journalism. If you're sympathetic to the powerful, it's objective journalism. That's pretty much says it all. <clears throat> so, obviously, obviously when you... So obviously, when you, there is the, uh, it is much easier to get stories when you're a Financial Times journalist because you get it all on a plate, really. Everyone wants to talk to you, and you have access to all the people. So you get interviews that by themselves are newsworthy, that sort of thing. So when you leave, you have to sort of realign and try and understand how you might do good investigative journalism without that access. Uh, and it, it, you can do it. So for example, in the Haiti case, I used a variety of different tools 
uh, from the, the WikiLeaks materials were amazing because basically the same people that I'd interviewed, I could see what they were saying privately and just sort of contradict it. And, uh, and they basically said the same sort of thing, but they were much more uh, honest in the WikiLeaks cables, as you might expect. But there's also freedom, of, I use Freedom of Information Act requests because there's tons of US agencies working there from USAID to the National Endowment for Democracy and all the usual suspects. So I got tons of uh, documents uh, about uh, their operations and what they were trying to do in Haiti and how they were part of this attempt to, to uh, do the shock doctrine there. I also spoke to people who had formerly been at the World Bank, uh, so ex-employees who don't have an institutional commitment to the, to the World Bank or what, whatever institution it is anymore, and they're often the best people to talk to because they're angry, they know exactly how it works, and they want to talk to journalists. Well, I, that's what I found anyway. And then the other thing that is always a good way to... Uh, I, I, I like using this a lot for investigations, is to actually go to the people on the ground because they're the ones that they, don't, they, ha, they can see things in a very clear-eyed way that you won't get from a corporate lawyer who's trying to manipulate you or some uh, official in the World Bank. The, 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 the peasants we spoke to in El Salvador knew exactly what was going on better than anyone. So we got, we got loads of important testimony there that we could use against the corporations, uh, and it worked. Uh, I just want to finish with, because this has been quite pessimistic about... Uh, how we do journalism in the corporate media. I mean, and I think it is pessimistic, but I think as, as, as the corporate media is sort of crumbling and people don't trust it in the way they used to, what we're seeing is a whole birth of a whole new set of medias which are giving us a license and, and places to go when we have stories uh, and uh, with an independence that doesn't exist in other places. So I've got a few uh, logos up there. Uh, I was actually at the Bristol Cable a couple of weeks ago, and this is a, a new magazine which is open in Bristol in England. Uh, and there's, it, the model is really, really interesting. It's all about democratizing journalism. So it's not this idea that you send the report. So the Guardian has their great white hope go to uh, uh, Brazil and interview some poor people and, and come back with a story. They, their, their idea is that you train communities themselves so they can write about themselves and write about their own issues. There's not this power imbalance, which is always sort of implicit uh, in the journalism that happens in the West. So... Um, yeah, and then I've said the breakdown of the political centre in the West has been paralleled by the breakdown of the media centre. So I think that's definitely true. I think, as you've seen, so there's a parallel process with uh, all the, the rise of people like Jeremy Corbyn in the UK and Bernie Sanders in the US, Trump on the other end. But the, the centre is not holding anymore. And what you're seeing is that's happening in the media. And the media institutions are very, very scared of this because as soon as they're... The only thing they can dine out on now is their reputation. And as soon as their reputation doesn't exist in the way it, it did, and I don't think it does anymore, then there's not, they have nothing because the, the, basically the tools of journalism have been democratised and we can all do it now. So uh, I want to end with that, on that optimistic note that, um, yeah, we, we, there's a lot of hope. Can I, can I have the microphone here? Maybe you can come up. Kerry Shankman is here, a very uh, important lawyer for all of us. Can I ask you one question? Uh, if I listen to all the talks, <laughs> is it true that journalists are in more danger than before? Is it true that activists are in more danger than before? Are we actually getting into times that Tim Jenkins survived in South Africa? Kerry Shankman. I'm a First Amendment human rights lawyer based out of uh, New York City. I work with Michael Ratner in the Center for Constitutional Rights, representing uh, journalists. Um, you might know me. Uh, one of our more prominent clients is uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, and we worked on the um, on the UN win last month. And as to your question, I, I think actually, oh. yes, <laughs> we are very happy you're here. Yeah. I, I really think looking at the history is, is critical, um, and, and that brings me to the, the real value behind um, Mr. Jenkins' talk. Um, I, I think there was a lot of shock I saw on Twitter the other day when there was a New York Times story last week that got completely buried, but it was about how uh, the NSA is going to begin uh, more intelligence sharing with domestic uh, U.S. Uh, law enforcement agencies, meaning that um, NS, uh, the results of bulk surveillance could be used uh, in criminal trials. And that, that should really come as no surprise, the same as NSA backdoors being used over 25 years ago should be as no surprise. If you look at, at the history, the history is clear that uh, even though there's sort of a, a a rule of law, and as a, as a lawyer, we work within a system of laws. Oftentimes, you're up against uh, adversaries that will circumvent those laws. 
if you are a dissident, if you are challenging power. And that, that's something that is nothing new. So I, I think the fundamental issues that I, I face, um, the fundamental issues that came up in the UN case uh, with, with Julian, I, I, I think those are, are nothing new. So in terms of the UK and Sweden flouting the international human rights system, that's shocking. But I, I, I think that this is something that, that does have a history. What is new is the technological aspect, and I think that is rather scary. So whereas historically there has been little respect for journalist source protection um, for high profile cases, uh, oftentimes little respect for uh, attorney client communications in high profile cases, there is an unprecedented ability to monitor those communications and intercept them. And I, I am very scared when I am approached by, uh, by clients, uh, journalists, who will often have, uh, will often want to com uh, communicate in a secure means with me, but by the time that they've presented their case to me, uh, more likely than not, often they might have already blown uh, their source. Uh, and what we often don't talk about too is journalist attorney communications. If you think journalist source communications are a problem, journalist attorney communications are, are a huge problem and attorney attorney communications are atrocious. That's something I, I think we really need to have more conversations about. It's something I, I witness a lot with my colleagues and I, I hope in the future that the, the legal profession will be a lot more responsive to the issues that, the new issues we face right now. Great, yeah. please join our panel. Yeah. Can we ask some questions from the hall? Oh. Here's a microphone. Who would like to ask a question or make a comment? Well, then I guess, Tim, would you like to tell us one more story? We have another 10 minutes. We love your stories. Story. Yeah, Tim, yeah, Tim Jenkins, yeah, please come tell another story. Yeah, more stories from Tim. Somebody got a question? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, let's hear the question. We, we have a question in the room. Oh, okay. The question is, can Tim please tell us? I'll, I'll keep it short, because I also want to hear the story. Um, I just wanted to ask one question um, about the, um, the Financial Times conflict. What lesson did you take home uh, for yourself that gave you the conviction to continue? I mean, how is it, as we all go through this process of opposition, self-doubt, all of the things that people in this room are familiar with. But what was it, that, what point of wisdom did you come to that you felt strong enough to inspire you to continue? If you can describe that. Yeah, that's, a good, that's a good question and um, one that a lot of people have asked. But I think what it was is that I never went into journalism for a career, so I didn't go into it because I wanted to be a journalist, uh, of, uh, of high status journalist for a newspaper. So I wanted to, I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but I wanted to use it as a tool to change the world for the better. So it was not a difficult decision when it started becoming very hard to do that within the context of the Financial Times to leave. Uh, and so for me, but the, re the problem is, is that it was quite interesting being inside because I had that critical mind before I went in, I could analyze it while I was there. But the people, I went in with, the, with about six other people and they all still there and they basically all gradually shaved off their rougher edges. Some of them were lefties when they started and they just gradually shaved off their rougher edges and become part of institutionalized thinking. And you have to because the alternative is you spend 30 years going into an office where you think differently to everyone else. They think you're some sort of weirdo uh, and you have a breakdown when you're like 50. Or you, or, so I understand completely the psychology of why people get on that trade and stay on it. But for me, it was never hard to make that decision because I never went into journalism because I wanted to be a high-profile Financial Times journalist. I wanted to do, uh, use journalism to help people, basically. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed everything everyone had to say on the panel, but um, uh, Tim, I think you were basically the first cypherpunk. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> My hat is off to you, and I wondered if you could just talk for the rest of this conference until yes. Snowden shows up uh, about a few things. And one thing in particular is how you coped with living in exile, and if you could also talk about the time that you broke out of the Pretoria prison, and maybe you could uh, talk about basically some of the crimes that you committed that were morally justified <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> to encourage more people to commit yeah. more crimes. Mm. 
in service of justice. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, you've labeled them crimes, okay, that's fine. <laughs> and I was convicted of all kinds of nasty things. I was convicted under the Terrorism Act, and then they had a Communism Act or something, Suppression of Communism Act, and there were a whole uh, list of other acts. So this is what a communist terrorist escaped convict looks like. So that's me. Um, um, when the kind of so-called crimes that we were... I was sent back into South Africa in, in the early 1970s. I left South Africa briefly to find out about my own country. And what I found out was quite shocking. And that inspired me to join the ANC and come back and do stuff in South Africa. And the, the task that I was given with another guy who, who I worked with and went to prison with was to distribute ANC literature because this was a very dark time. The ANC was banned in 1960 and it set up then an underground thing called Mkwonto with Siswe, which was led by Nelson Mandela. And then Nelson Mandela was uh, arrested and sentenced to life Prison, imprisonment, in fact, four life imprisonments, and all the ANC leader, leaders who appeared in the same trial all received the same kind of sentence. So the ANC, in a sense, was broken in the 1960s, and those remaining fled into exile and set up headquarters in Lusaka, and others uh, managed to get to London and set up structures there. Uh, so for many years there was no activity, the ANC really was wiped out by the regime and it was only in the early 1970s that some foreign recruits were sent into South Africa simply to do propaganda work, to, to uh, keep alive the idea that the ANC was there, that there was a liberation struggle and that they were fighting to overcome apartheid. Um, so I was kind of one of those first recruits but I wasn't a foreign recruit. I came from South Africa, I went to London, joined the ANC there, and they sent me back to South Africa to set up a kind of propaganda unit. Um, so our task was to set up a print factory, print uh, publications, and to distribute this literature. And they gave us a whole bunch of uh, unique ways of distributing pamphlets. So you couldn't stand at a street corner and offer it to passers-by or stick it through car windows and traffic lights. It was very, very dangerous. So one of the methods they taught us to use was called a leaflet bomb. Now, that sounds very terroristic, but it wasn't really a bomb as such. It was a small explosive device, and you had this pile of leaflets inside, <laughs> inside a shopping bag or basket or just a bag of rubbish and you would walk around the street and find a good spot for it where there's a crowd of people, say at the bus stop or railway station. And you would put this bag down next to a whole pile of rubbish and uh, had a timer in it for about five minutes and you'd clear out of there and this thing would go bang and these leaflets would fly up into the air. <laughs> and then we had another one that worked from top of buildings, uh, which would really just be a huge banner like 20 meters long saying ANC lives, and then rolled up inside there were hundreds of leaflets, and this was also released by a little explosive device. There'd be a bang, some cloud of smoke, and this thing would unfurl, and the leaflets would, would uh, fall into the street. Uh, so those were a couple of the methods that were used, and um, um, we were all obviously printing, doing a lot of printing. We had publications and mailing lists. And it was even very dangerous just posting things. So you couldn't just take a thousand letters and stick them into a letterbox. You had to spend the whole night driving all through the city and you had to have a, a list of every single post box and you could put like four letters in each one. And it took you the whole night to post a few hundred leaflets. Um, but anyway, the message got out. And in fact, uh, the leaflet bombs themselves were you know, it was just a few hundred leaflets that were going up each time and people would grab them. But what was really important was that immediately afterwards the police would come with their sirens and lights and all that and there'd be a huge commotion and they'd try and confiscate all these leaflets. And then it would appear in the newspapers for the next few days, ANC terrorists attack or something, or some massive headline which 
then told the story about how these bombs, dangerous bombs, had gone off and everybody was endangered and so on. So that was actually, you know, people could understand the language because terrorism was treated by the local population as freedom fighter or a terrorist. <clears throat> so you just had to do a bit of interpretation there. Anyway, so uh, yeah, we were doing this for two and a half years and eventually got arrested. People have asked me, well, how did they get onto you? And I don't really have an answer for that. I think it was just careful police forensic work over those two and a half years. In a way, you, you kind of, um, you make a, a circle around yourself because all they need to do is like have a map up on the wall and put a pin every time a leaflet bomb goes off or something <laughs> happens. And, and they kind of circle an area where the activists must be operating from. Then they might have a list of 10 activists in that area and they start watching them and following them and eventually they get onto someone. But um, as I was trying to say in my uh, presentation, for us the weakness was not uh, that, it was that we couldn't communicate. We were actually aware that uh, the police were following us and monitoring us, all kinds of weird things were happening. But we didn't know what to do. We started getting paranoid, thinking that everyone's following us, everyone's watching us. You couldn't tell the difference between the police spy and just someone else in the street. And if we'd had good communications, we could have um, been in touch with our operators and saying, look, we think they're onto us, what can we do? We need money to get out of here, whatever. But we didn't have that. So that was our downfall. <clears throat> then you wanted to know about... Um, Pretoria Prison, so the two of us were sent to Pretoria Prison with uh, these long sentences. And um, actually before we even got to the prison, we'd taken a decision that we were going to escape. And uh, while we were awaiting trial, they didn't give us bail, so we were uh, sitting in this prison as unconvicted prisoners, so we were allowed to receive books and food parcels and things like that. We got our family to smuggle us some money and one of the books they sent in was a book called Papillon. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. A very famous book about a French uh, prisoner in the 1930s. He was sent to Devil's Island and he was a serial escapist, but a very intelligent one. And he wrote this book about how to escape, essentially. And we learned a lot of tips from that. And he said, <laughs> number one, you need money. So we smuggle in money. And number two, you've got to find a place to hide it. And you need to hide it in your body. I won't go into any more detail about that. <laughs> so we were walking around with this money inside of us for a few months. Um, then he said uh, a number of very things, uh, important things that I don't really want to go in. One is when you get out of your prison, you can only plan up to the prison front door or over the top of the wall. After that, you don't really know anything about the environment. You can't plan outside that. So the thing is then to just get away as quickly as you can. Don't use that money to go to the pub and celebrate and hang about. <laughs> or go to a restaurant to get some real food. Just get the hell out of there as quickly as you can. The money is for taxis or aeroplanes or helicopters or whatever. Just get out of there and go as far as possible. Obviously, you've got to have civilian clothing. You can't look like an escaped convict when you get out. Uh, get away as quickly as you can, as far as you can, and uh, try and make contact with people who can help you. And don't go back to your family or go see your wife or your girlfriend or something like that, because that's obviously the first place they're going to look for you. Okay, we so, have to, uh, I think we have to stop. Okay. Do you want to go on in, uh, in another <laughs> space? I'm sorry. I got a lot of stories. We have, yeah, we are gonna set up the link with Moscow. That's how it is. Hmm? <laughs> I agree. But the thing is, 